hey, I'm fasting, so the whole world is going the way I want it to go. Everything's working because I'm fasting. It's automatically working. That's not how this works. Isn't there like a way to measure if the fast is actually having a benefit for us? Because otherwise, we could be putting ourselves in this spot where we're just fasting too much or we're not fasting enough or we don't know if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So we figured, let's understand what we are looking for measurable things to know that your fasting lifestyle has been working, not just your specific fast at one point in time. Is the whole lifestyle you're living working for you? Let's dive in. Down below, there's a 30% off discount link for your entire grocery order through Thrive Market. I encourage you to check them out because if you are doing any kind of like fasting lifestyle or anything like that, they have so many options that fit into that category. They're an online grocery store. So it's like going to the grocery store except it's online and so easy to sort by different diet type, by different, you know, sugar-free, high protein, this, that, vegan, plant, whatever. Doesn't matter, super easy. And the cool thing is because you're seeing this, that link down below saves you 30% off your entire first grocery order plus gets you $50 gift free. Okay, so that's a ton of savings and you get to shop for things that are probably not available at your grocery store and realistically probably better priced than your grocery store to begin with and it gets delivered to your doorstep. So that link is down below for Thrive Market. First thing you need to look at, as much as it might not be super fun, you do need to measure your glucose. And what I mean by this is, if you've been practicing a fasting lifestyle for at least two months, you should start seeing a measurable improvement in your glucose levels. So you should measure your fasting glucose and you should measure what is called your postprandial glucose, okay? What your glucose does right after you eat. Now, the reason I want you to do this is because one of the major benefits of fasting is the potential improvement in insulin resistance, the potential glucose modulation effects and the ability to be more insulin sensitive. If you're not seeing a benefit there, then maybe you're not fasting enough or maybe it's just not working for you, or maybe you're doing something wrong and you should start diving into some more videos and understand. Maybe you're eating during your fast, maybe you're consuming too much cream, things like that, right? There's an interesting study that was published in Scientific Reports that looked at 12 million people. Okay, it's a huge study, 12 million people. They looked at people that had a range of glucose from 100 to 199, and what they found is that for every 18 point, 18 milligram per deciliter increase in glucose, there was a 13% increased risk of mortality. So there is a very strong, very strong correlation between higher glucose and higher mortality. Now what they deemed to be the perfect number based upon all this data of these 12 million people was between 80 and 94 milligrams per deciliter for your fasting glucose. Word to the wise, when you're measuring your fasting glucose, I do not literally mean during a fast, I mean on a regular day that you're not fasting prior to having breakfast. You're basically 10 to 12 hour fasting glucose. That does tell you a lot, but it doesn't even tell you as much as your postprandial glucose does. If fasting has been effective for you and you're having a measurable improvement, you will notice that you bounce back from a carbohydrate meal faster. You may have a normal spike, but then you come right back down. If you measure your glucose two hours after a meal and your glucose has not come down all that much, you need to look at insulin resistance being a serious thing and you might need to increase the length of your fast or you might need to increase the frequency of your fast because it's a very measurable indicator. The other thing you should really look at, and this is something you can do independent, like each individual fast, your ketones should be elevated. If you measure your ketones via through your breath, through your blood, whatever, they should be elevated above 0.7 millimoles, ideally one millimole for at least an eight hour period of time. Now again, here's the thing. You're watching this video, you might be someone that's doing a 16 hour fast and you're wondering, well, how on earth can I get my ketones elevated for eight hours with a 16 hour fast? Unless you're doing a lower carb diet to begin with, that's pretty difficult. So I understand that. So let it be known that I'm talking more so about longer fasts, like a 20 to 24 hour fast, which I'm much more of a proponent of versus a 16, eight. Now with these lengths of fasts, if you start producing adequate ketones at like 14 or 16 hours, all you have to do is take the fast to 22-ish hours and you've been exposed to higher ketone levels for a full eight hours. In my opinion, and this is somewhat speculative and somewhat hypothetical, having eight hours of ketone exposure is really a nice number. It gives you time for the ketones to have a positive effect. You're not just flashing into ketosis and coming out. Okay, so pay attention to that. And that is really a goal for you with your fasting. If you need to cut out coffee, you need to cut out tea, you need to cut out the creamer, whatever, to get there, so be it. It's a measurement for you to know. 
This next one is a very big one because this is more of an indicator that things are not working and you might need to turn down the fasting a little bit. Your strength goes down. And I don't mean right during a fast or the day after a fast. I mean overall. If you were to log how much weight you are pushing in the gym or what you're doing, if you were to pay attention to it and write it down, over the weeks, would your numbers be decreasing? Okay, you do have to pay attention to this because if your numbers are decreasing and you're losing muscle, you're defeating the purpose of the fast. When you look at studies, like one that was published in uh, Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise, it demonstrated that the amount of muscle mass you carry has a direct, direct correlation with all-cause mortality. Lower muscle, more mortality. Higher muscle, less mortality. It is preserving and good to have muscle. And if you are fasting so much that you're losing muscle, I think you're fasting too much. Because if you fast, you can allow yourself to burn fat without building muscle. But it's a nice little gray area there that you can slip into where you start losing fat and muscle. If you fast infrequently enough, which I've done other videos on the right frequency, you will hit that sweet spot where you lose fat and can kind of at least maintain muscle or at least have such a negligible loss that it doesn't impact your strength. So pay attention to that. That is your strongest, probably outside of the glucose, it's your strongest barometer of if things are going too far or not. The next one is your lipid biomarkers, your various, you know, LDL, HDL, things like that. If those things aren't improving, ask yourself the question if you are really doing the right thing or if you're fasting enough. So here's the thing, if you go and you fast and you do a 24 hour fast, but the next day you compensate all those calories that you lost during that fast by eating a smorgasbord of Twinkies, that's a problem, right? Okay, if you do a 48 hour fast and then you open your mouth to a dump truck full of Skittles or I don't know, a bunch of butter that's just gonna overdo it, think about it, that's a problem, right? So again, it forces you to take a look in the mirror, okay, and not, as I always say, throw the baby out with the bathwater or put the cart before the horse because like, you're saying, okay, I'm going to fast and that's more important than the fact that I'm actually having a negligible or even a detrimental effect on my body with this lifestyle because I'm overcompensating on the days I'm not fasting. It's not a license to eat whatever you want. And it may sound foreign to you, but you would be surprised at how many people I talk to that fast for 24 hours and then indulge so much the next day and they see it as a license to do so and their lipid biomarkers go to crud. So pay attention to that. They should be improving. This next one is probably the most anecdotal and probably the most circumstantial, but also the most telling if you know what to look for. So there's this thing called the keto flu. So you may not do keto, but if you are doing a ketogenic protocol, you have this period of time where you, when you transition to keto, you just don't feel good. It's called the keto flu. It's because your body's trying to adapt to use fats, but it's not used to it yet. So what ends up happening here, if you fast enough, whether you do keto or not, if you are fasting enough, you should be able to cut out carbs two to three days and not have any negative feelings. You should be able to cut out carbs and transition into a ketogenic protocol, no problem. You should not really get the keto flu if you've been fasting frequently enough because you are already getting the fat adaptation and the mitochondrial biogenesis and the mitochondrial adaptation and the increase just in overall transport vehicles. If you're not fasting enough, you're not gonna have that. So you're still gonna feel the symptoms of a keto flu. If you are fasting frequently enough, even with carbs, when you do omit carbs, it should be a seamless thing for you. It's pretty wild, but it makes a lot of sense. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.